Welcome to Public Health On Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Our focus is the novel coronavirus. I'm Josh Sharfstein, a faculty member at Johns Hopkins and also a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal with this podcast is to bring evidence and experts to help you understand today's news about the novel coronavirus and what it means for tomorrow. If you have questions, you can email them to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, Stephanie Desmond talks to Annette Anderson from the Johns Hopkins School of Education. They discuss the short and long-term impacts of moving K-12 education online and how the pandemic is transforming how we teach our kids. Let's listen. I'm here today with Annette Anderson from the Johns Hopkins School of Education, and we're going to talk about the impact of the coronavirus-related shutdowns of pre-K through 12 education. Annette, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me, Stephanie. I'd like to hear what is happening for students now that we've moved to online education or perhaps no education at all. Well, I think that a lot of things are happening simultaneously. First of all, schools are trying to figure out how to ramp up to or maintain the same levels of education as they had when schools were doing school, quote unquote, face to face. Um, But now that the platform has changed, it has meant that some schools are going to virtual platforms that they've already invested in. Some schools are ramping up to try to get to that level of virtual instruction. And then you have uh, some other schools that have just decided that they can't ramp up and that instead they are ramping down um, and that they are using, uh, they're using packets and paper instruction to try to meet the, the needs and the demands of students. So you're seeing a lot of things happening at the same time. So my high schooler has like 30 minute classes a day and and really just each class once a week for 30 minutes. Like, is that really going to help him to maintain his learning? I think what everybody has to keep in mind is that this has happened overnight. And so it was just a huge shift for schools. It was a huge shift for the teachers. It was a huge shift for the students and for the families. We have all, no one has been spared in the education community. So everyone is trying to adjust to this. I think that some schools are doing the right thing by trying to ease their way into virtual learning. Uh, We don't know how long this will last. It may last for three more weeks. It may last for three more months. So I think that schools are just trying to take the temperature to see what the response rates are of schools and families so that they can know how quickly they can ramp up. Now, some schools have been able to do this very very quickly because they are used to having online platforms. Some schools have made the investment long ago of having a one-to-one device so that every student has a device and uh, students also have online access. But, uh, but some other schools are challenged by that right now. So they're trying to take it as it comes. And I guess this is um, really exposing the digital divide. Could you describe what that is and, and tell me how it's affecting it? Sure. So some families and are, are really blessed to be in schools where their children have had access to top-rate technology and digital access since preschool. In other districts, there has been a gradual level of access to that. Um, We know that some of our urban school districts are most challenged right now because they have so many competing demands in urban schools that they have not necessarily been able to fulfill that same level of rollout historically. And so now our urban schools are trying to play catch up in some ways. But I also do want to say that I think our urban schools have really stepped up in the midst of this pandemic because they have in some ways become de facto governmental agencies to be able to handle the food insecurity needs of students and families, as well as some of the other mental health needs and social supports that families have in the midst of this COVID-19 challenge. So I think that, you know, while some schools have not been able to ramp up to the same level of digital access, and there are going to be consequences for that down the road, um, I think that, you know, some urban schools have tried to be very creative to respond to this challenge. But the digital divide is real. And a lot of schools were challenged by that long before the coronavirus ever came on the scene. 
And I think, you know, I've seen neighbors whose children are in private school, they have full day education every day and they have almost since the beginning. Because they're paying tuition. Right, and so that's really <laughs> also exposing sort of a public-private yes. divide as well. Yes. Yes, yes. So those schools are trying to keep as much of their learning ramped up as possible so that there is continuity of learning. But, you know, in a private independent school model, those families have, in many cases, they've already paid for the year. And so they're trying to make sure those schools have a responsibility to those families to make sure that those students are getting the education that those families have already paid for. So, you know, it's a little bit different, but it's certainly, you know, I think that a lot of independent schools also, they were leading leaders in, in this way because they were able to very quickly transition. They did not take a break from any of the independent schools. They were able to rally quickly and be able to get their students online and then start to think about how to connect them to technology outside of the classroom. So you talked a little bit earlier about the 30-minute segments, and I think that, you know, they started doing that. Uh, in many cases, I've seen a lot of examples of independent schools starting there, and so they had a few weeks ahead of the rest of the public schools in terms of being able to get ready for what this new online learning environment looks like. So we've all heard of sort of about the summer slide, that kids lose some of their, uh, what they've learned over the summer, and you have to play catch up in the fall. This could potentially be a lot longer than a summer slide. Do you think we're going to see a COVID slide? What impact will that have? I think that there is, beyond a, a COVID slide, I think there are going to be COVID ramifications. I think that it will touch so many different pieces of the education system that we haven't really thought all the way down to the bottom of yet. From staffing to thinking about, you know, how we do professional development for teachers, I think that's another challenge to think about. Um, there's just so much that has been impacted by all of this. And I think that schools are really trying to figure out how do they stem this COVID slide, quote unquote, but I think a lot of it, you know, they just don't know the fiscal ramifications of all of this, of districts trying to figure out how they're going to pay for all of these additional resources and technology um, supports that are needed. All of this is going to cost money and it's going to cost time. So, you know, school districts are trying to think about is the, should we have classes in the summer? Should we have online learning through the balance of the year? Should we do additional supports on the weekends? There's a lot Lot of creative ideas that are, are being tossed around right now because people just don't know how deep this learning loss will be. But there's also, you know, another component of this, which is that you have to have your staff safe and healthy as well and really able to deliver all of these, all of these services to students. Because if students are doing all of this work, you have to have staff who are in place to be able to assess it and who are able to give feedback to students in a timely way. So th there are lots of ramifications to all these pieces that we just don't know yet. But we're, you know, we will see, as I think as the spring continues to unfold, I think we will see how uh, schools are starting to pivot to, to respond to this challenge. I would say that parents who maybe didn't really respect the work of the teachers that much before <laughs> are really learning what it's like to be a teacher. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yes, I think it has been a joy for me as a as a person who has been a classroom teacher to see parents really say, wow, I will go out of my way to buy you a pony or <laughs> a Lamborghini if you want, because I never really understood all of the work, all of the dedication, all of the motivation that goes into being able to organize and differentiate for student learning and success. So I'm really thrilled that people have been so appreciative of the work of parents. I think seeing a lot of parents trying to homeschool while they work has been just, you know, another level of humor. You know, I, I at my own house, my daughter has taken up baking. And so we are calling that home economics because it's important for her to learn those skills and she's measuring and that's math. So, you know, it depends on how much time parents have to be able to devote to this. But I am really, I think it is, it is long overdue for teachers to be honored 
and administrators as well, because they put their hearts and their souls into educating our children and they deserve the respect that is due. And hopefully they will begin to also see some, you know, some of this in, in the form of improvements in their salaries and pay scales and benefits, because it's a huge sacrifice. And teachers do not, I think a lot of people think that teachers, you know, work from nine to two and then they get the summers off and <laughs> that's it. But there's a lot of work that goes into planning for children's success and student success. And I think that we are really in a good place to be able to honor our, our, our educators right now. I have read stories about parents, um, you know, really nurturing their children's interests and helping them to explore this and that. And I say, oh my gosh, I can barely, you know, function. I'm either, I'm really impressed or sometimes I think maybe they're lying. <laughs> Yes, it's understandable. I, I just think that, you know, we, we have for so long, we've taken for granted that what we've taken for granted what our teachers do on a daily basis. And, um, you know, when you see, you know, the, the concert band teachers who are organizing online instruction for those students, when you see, the, you know, Spanish teachers and language arts teachers, you know, just really attuning to their craft and making sure that students get what they need. I, I give my, take my hat off to people who are trying to help seniors right now who are trying to meet graduation requirements. That's so significant. And everybody is really trying Trying to be creative, state departments of education are really lending in a hand and trying to be flexible as well. So there's a really uh, big sense of we're, we're all in this together in the education community right now. And you know, it's it's unfortunate that this circumstance has brought us to this, but I think that it has shown the the will and the tenor of the people who are in education to try to to really rise to this challenge. You know, schools aren't only, in many cases, a place for learning, right? So a lot of people depend on schools for meals, and a lot of people depend on schools for social work and mental health. And I'm wondering where that lands us. I do know that our local school system has several, has a dozen or more schools open for to feed uh, children, to hand out lunches. I'm wondering what happens to those other roles in a time like this? Well, I've seen the school counselors reaching out. I've seen, you know, administrators giving a list of resources to uh, local organizations and agencies to help support families. So I think that, again, people are trying as best they can. I had a conversation here in Baltimore City with the director of our city schools communications office, and she said that they yesterday fed 9,000 families. So I think that's really significant. I mean, it's a huge lift on the, the part of the school districts to be able to organize this on a daily basis uh, when they have so many other things to attend to. So the fact that they are becoming the source for connection for people in the community right now, I think is it's very significant. And I think that they deserve a lot of credit for stepping up to the challenge um, to do this and to continue to do it, even as you know the challenge continues to go on. So what happens next? What are we going to see going forward? I mean, I've read that uh, in Maryland that the school superintendent says maybe we might not have school in the fall. So what happens next? Well, I think you're going to see a lot of parents who are going to be working very hard and making sure that we follow social distancing so we can potentially reverse that idea. But beyond that, you're seeing uh, transformations in how schools are thinking about delivering content. Um, that's happening at a rapid scale. I think institutions of higher education like ours and the School of Education, we're being very nimble and trying to think about how we can help to support teachers and administrators as they rethink the design of school. There's been a whole movement afoot about trying to figure out how we can do school differently, and it's come in a lot of different forms through the ed reform years. And uh, now I think that, you know, we are, because now we're in the, the years of ESSA, and I think we have an opportunity to really rethink how we deliver instruction to kids. And so it won't look the same. I don't think it will ever look the same um, exactly. And you'll see a lot of investments in technology, but not just in technologies, but in the social emotional learning supports as well that we know our students need. I think districts are, are rightly so figuring out that they want to make sure that they're doubling down in this area. And I think a lot of people, you know, 10 years ago, they thought that SEL was more of a soft skills kind of uh, approach and maybe we didn't need it as much. And now we're realizing that 
that our schools needed, not only for the students in our schools, but also for the staff. Our teachers need social emotional supports, our administrators need SEL supports, and our families. So thinking about how school schools, the role of schools, I think, in all of this, the role of the school has become more central to everything that we're doing in the United States right now than I think almost any other institution besides the healthcare system. So it's the healthcare system, number one, but then we're seeing the role of public education in the schools being really number two in helping to support communities and families. And I think you're going to see that continue to be a huge uh, piece of the conversation going forward. Annette Anderson, thank you so much for this very interesting conversation. Absolutely. I'm so delighted to be here. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for listening to Public Health on Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Please send questions to be covered in future podcasts to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. This podcast is produced by Josh Sharpstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Lamare Morales. Audio production by Niall Owen McCusker and Spencer Greer, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening.